Um, I'm Bobby Smith, and I'm going to be your facilitator or teacher this morning. And I'm going to have picked a, a subject called the Oral Torah. So let's, uh, let's start as we should, with, as we always should, with a prayer. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, our Father in Heaven. Father, thank you for this wonderful Shabbat day, for bringing us here safely this morning, and for the blessings of being able to take a breath this morning and to live, Father. Thank you for all the blessings that you put that you put before us in our lives, and thank you for your word and for what your word means to each of us in our walk, in our faith in you, Father. Be with us this morning, open our hearts and our minds to touch us with your wisdom of your Torah, Father. In Yeshua's name I pray, amen. So I um, wanted to talk a little bit about the oral Torah this morning because if you study Torah, you can't help but be introduced or exposed to the oral Torah. And there's a lot of confusion as to what it exactly is and how it, um, how it relates to app application in, our, in, in studying Torah or how it, it, it relates in helping us to understand Torah. So I wanted to explain a little bit of, of, about what that is and, um, and just see if, if, I mean, this would be something that you probably could teach on for a month, you know, but just in a, in a short, Hour, we will uh, cover as much as much as we can. The Oral Torah, which is Hebrew for Torah She Be'al Pe, which means Torah that is on the mouth. What is the Oral Torah, and did Yeshua follow the Oral Torah? Is the Oral Torah applicable to us as Messianic believers today? These are questions that I began asking upon my journey into Messianic Judaism. And I know that as I've talked to others within our congregation or within the classes that I um, have been a part of, sometimes it's confusing and there's a lot of debate about it. So let's try to dive into it and, and see what, what we think. John Parsons, who's um, the author of Hebrew for Christians, or the, I guess he's the founder of Hebrew for Christians, says this, traditional Judaism believes that when Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and nights, writing down the words of the Torah, God also provided him with the additional explanations that were not incorporated into the written text. This additional commentary of the written Torah is called the Oral Torah. Torah Shebal Pe, from or by mouth. The words of, that Moses finally committed to the writing of the Torah scroll, which the Hebrew for Torah scroll is Torah Shibiah, I'm sorry, I, I butchered that. Torah, Shibik, Hatav. According to this view, there were actually two Torahs given to Moses on Sinai, the written Torah and the oral Torah. And together, these are considered the full revelation of the Torah. When the J Jewish people speak of Torah, they're talking about both the written Torah and the oral Torah. Mamamides, Rambam, was a chief spokesman for this brand of Judaism. And he wrote, Every commandment which the Holy One, blessed be he, gave to Moses our teacher was given with its clarification. First he told him the commandment, which is the written Torah, and then he expounded on its explanation and content, including all that which is included in the Torah, which is the commentary. This doctrine is enshrined in the opening verse of Perke Avot, Chapters of the Fathers, which is a tra tractate of the Mishnah. Moses received the Torah from Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, the prophets handed it down to the men of the great assembly, and so on and so on and so on. It, it, it went all the way through until it was actually written down in the, um, basically it wasn't written down until like the third century. They said three things. Be deliberate in judgment, raise up many disciples, and make a fence around the Torah. This is the explanation from Chabad. The Torah has two parts, the written law and the oral law. 
God told Moses that he will give the Torah and the commandments. Why did God add the word commandments? Are there any commandments which are not included in the Torah? This verse, amongst others, is a clear reference to the existence of the oral Torah. The oral Torah was transmitted from father to son, from teacher to disciple, through the ages. Originally, the oral Torah was not transcribed. Instead, it was transmitted from father and son, from teacher to disciple, thus the name of oral Torah. Approximately 1,800 years ago, between the 2nd and 3rd century, Rabbi Judah Hanasi, Hanasi, which is, he was termed Judah the Prince, concluded that because of all the travails of exile, the oral law would be forgotten if it would not be recorded on paper. He therefore assembled the scholars of his generation and compiled the Mishnah, a shorthanded collection of all the oral teachings that preceded him. Since then, the oral law has ceased to be oral, and as time passed, more and more of the previously oral tradition was recorded. The oral law consists of three components. The laws given to Moses at Sinai, which are termed halakha. When Moses went up to heaven to receive the Torah, God gave him the written Torah together with many instructions. These instructions are called halakha la Moshe M. Sinai, the law given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Mamamides, Rambam, writes that it is impossible for there to be an argument or disagreement concerning a halakha la Moshe Ma Sinai. For the Jews who heard the instructions from Moses implemented them into their daily lives and passed on to their children, who passed on to their children, etc., etc., etc. Some examples of this halakha is tefillin. Straps must be black. A sukkah must have at least two and a half walls. All different halakha measurements and sizes. The 13 principles of exegesis, which is an explanation or interpretation. When God gave the written law, law to Moses, he also instructed him how one was to study and understand the Torah. Every word and letter in the Torah is exact, and many laws can be extrapolated from an extra or missing word or letter, or particularly a sequence while the, which the Torah chooses to use. The 13 principles, which are the keys to uncovering the secrets of the Torah, are called Shlash Eshrei. Midot Shetorah Nidresh Baim. For instance, one of the rules is anything which was included in a general statement but was removed from the general statement in order to teach something was not removed to teach only by itself but to apply its teaching to the entire generality. An example of this rule is in Exodus 35.3. The Torah says, you shall not light fire in any of your dwellings on Shabbat. Now kindling a fire was already included in the general statement that prohibits work on the Sabbath. It was removed from the general rule and stated independently in this verse to teach us that it is a distinct form of work and as such carries a distinct penalty. Moreover, the lesson applies to each of the 39 categories of work included in that general statement. Thus, there isn't a broad category called work. Rather, each type of work is to be viewed as distinct. Therefore, if someone should do several kinds of work while unaware that they are forbidden on the Shabbat, he must bring a separate sin offering to atone for each type of work that he did. A full list of these 13 principles are in your Siddur, if you have a uh, Jewish Siddur. The third thing was edicts, or Gezerot. The Torah authorizes the rabbis to protect the word of the Torah through making Gezerot, which are edicts. For example, the Torah prohibition on eating or possessing hamets, leaven products on Passover, begins at the midday on the 14th day of Nisan, which is basically noon. Our sages added two hours to this prohibition, for they feared that on a cloudy day, people would err and eat hamets after noon. Just like the Congress is constantly in enacting laws and regulations for the old laws, reenacting basically, because the old laws are not adequate for like modern trends and tendencies, 
so too the rabbis constantly added their edicts or their gezerot according to the needs of their times. Although the Torah commands us to follow these gezerot, there are distinctions between a rabbinic decree and a Torah law. One of those distinctions is that where there is doubt concerning a Torah law, one must be stringent, whereas if there is doubt in a rabbinic decree, one may be lenient. Until the end of the Talmudic era, almost approximately 1,500 years ago, there was central rabbinic authority which issued these gezerot, which were accepted by all the Jews. Since then, different communities have assumed upon themselves various stringencies, but rarely are they universally accepted. Once the temple was destroyed, the central uh, the centrality, basically, of Judaism went away. So um, if you study history, you, you find that um, when Ju Jerusalem was completely destroyed and leveled, the, the, the center of um, Jewish authority, Jewish halakha, all that would, would move to wherever the, the exile was. And Babylon, as we know, is, is a very big center of where all that transpired. Oral law is likened to a body without a soul. Thus, when oral law seems to contradict the written Torah, our sense of textual loyalty seems violated. This is um, a commentary on uh, Parsha Behar. It's uh, Leviticus 25.1 through 26.2. It's, it's, um, it's kind of an analogy to give you an example of how the oral law would be applied to something that was in the Torah to give you a better understanding. Okay? It says, our Torah portion is the home of one of the classic examples of this apparent um, contradiction. The Torah states, you shall sanctify the 50th year and proclaim freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be the Jubilee year. Yovel, Yovel for you. What are the implications of this freedom? The Torah teaches that a Jewish servant works a six-year period of service. At the seventh year, if the servant shall say, I love my master, I don't want to go free, then his master shall bring him to the court, and he shall serve him forever. Le olam is the Hebrew word for forever. The Torah, Shebeal Peh, which is the oral Torah, clarifies that the term forever, Le olam, means until the Yovel. How so? I never have really been taught how to pronounce this rabbi's name, but uh, I'm going to do the best I can. Ibn Ezra. I-B-N, so Ibn Ezra. He's a 12th century Sephardic commentator, cites a verse from Colette, which is Ecclesiastes, which implies that the word olam can mean a period of time. Since Yovel is the longest block of time in the Jewish calendar, the word olam, taken in that sense, a long time, is appropriate. But even if Aban Ezra is technically correct, we must still ask why the Torah opts for this more ambiguous olam when it could simply state Yovel. Why create confusion in the first place? The words of Ramban on this topic are cryptic. The enlightened one will understand that forever, Leolam is literal, for one who works into Yovel has worked all the days of the world, olam, the world, words of the Mikilta, legal midrash of Exodus. Ribi says, Come and see that the world is only 50 years old, as it says, and he shall work forever unto Yovel. Ramban is describing the nature of the world. In some mystical way, the world only exists for 50 years. Rabbanu Bekahi, the late 13th century Sephardic, cites the Kabbalist who say that 50 represents the circle of life. On a national sex scale, consider the power of 50 days. In 50 days, the Jewish people were transformed from a beraggled nation of slaves to recipients of the Torah. We attempt the same metamorphosis each year during the counting of the Omer, when we count off 50 days from Passover to Shavuot. Similarly, the Levite may only serve in the Beit HaMedash, the temple, 
until the age of 50. At some level, his world too has been completed at that age. This is the powerful message of the Yovel, the Jubilee. Each seven years, Shemitah, the sabbatical cycle, represents a rung, a new level achieved within the world, which Yovel, Jubilee, which follows the seventh Shemitah year, represents the dawn of a completely new world. Even for the rational Jew, aware of the mystical notion of the Yovel cycle, the message of Rambam seems, seems powerful. A Jew need not die in order to arrive to a new world. Rather, he can transcend worlds in his lifetime. How fitting it is that a Yovel, the Jewish servant, is forced out, who has never lost his sense of destiny, who he has lost his sense of de destiny and in independence, but he must be taught that a Jew is never consigned to such fate. A new world with new hope beckons. It's like renewal, right? Life's renewed. We, we renew every day. Days are renewed. You know, it's, 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 it's this lesson of renewal. For, forever for us, we can't, con, we can't um, grasp the concept of infinity. We just can't. It's not possible for, for human beings to do that. So it could be that, uh, that that interpretation of the Torah has great merit. In order to better understand what we do and why we do it, we have to understand where we came from. Let's begin when this Torah and how we read and interpret the Torah today with understanding where it came from. Not just the Torah, but the entire Tanakh. There was this, this uh, group called the Men of the Great Assembly. And JewishHistory.org has a very concise and, and nice little summary type of description of the men of the Great Assembly. These men of the Great Assembly passed decrees that ensured the Jewish people's survival in the post-Temple era down to our times. They existed right after the destruction of the first temple, but while the second temple was being um, constructed and, and basically uh, put back into service which would have been around the year 410 B.C. through uh, 310 B.C. is when this 120 men of the Great Assembly would have been um, doing their work. At that time, when Jewish life in the land of Israel was crumbling, Ezra and Nehemiah swept in like a whirlwind. They not only closed the breaches in the physical walls of Jerusalem, they built the second temple, and set the foundation for the second commonwealth, which is the second temple era, but set the spiritual foundation and built the spiritual walls of the nation for the foreseeable future lasting until today. The primary vehicle through which they accomplished this was the establishment of a, an executive and legislative body called, you know what? I don't have the way to control this uh, PowerPoint. Can you go to the, probably the third, Change a couple of slides there. Let's see where we should be. One more. One more. There we go. So this is the what, what it was called, the Anshe Knesset Hagadol, which is the men of the great assembly, which was composed of the 120th greatest leaders, some of who were prophets, including Ezra, Nehemiah, Mordecai, Zerubbabel, Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. The modern day Israeli Knesset, Knesset is a Hebrew word for assembly, which has 120 members, took its name and number from them. Unfortunately, that's where the comparison ends. Their primary task was to smooth the transition into the new era by passing legislation that would, survive the, that would ensure the survival of the Jewish people. Among the most important measures were they sealed the scriptures. They decided on the canon of the scriptures. They decided on the, the Torah and the prophets and the writings, which is the, the, the term Tanakh. They instituted the prayers and the prayer services and how they, how they should be the order of the prayers and how they should be uh, honored in the temple. They coordinated the Jewish calendar. 
they establish an educational system in the land of Israel. All told, the men of the Great Assembly span no more than a generation, yet the reverberation of their decisions are still felt today. By studying their decrees, we gain entrance to a glimpse not only into the role in Jewish history, but of the primary ingredients that, that the Jewish people needed for survival. The first major decision was to seal the Bible, to decide which books to include in the Holy Scriptures. Prophecy had ceased in the Second Temple era. No longer could anyone claim to have an open line as it were to God. Therefore, without prophecy, there was no possibility of divine inspiration to warrant admittance of anyone's words into the Bible. One reason this was important was because later groups like the Christians felt it necessary to include certain books which were not included in the Jewish reckoning. These books, they wanted to believe, bridged the gap to the Christian Gospels, a gap for all intents and purposes that was closed centuries before the decree to seal the Bible. In all, the men of the Great Assembly included 24 books in the counting. Afterward, no more books could be added. As the central body of the greatest Jewish sages and scholars, their authority to do so was never disputed. There's a difference between the canonization of what we call the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Bible. And even the Christian Bible, you got the Catholic Bible that's got different books than the Protestant Bible, you know. Um, the, the Bible is the divine inspiration of the Word of God through God's people. And there's, 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 um, there's struggle between God's people. There are family. Any families are always a little dysfunctional, right? You know. So, so there, there there's uh, struggles between there. And there's some books that are left out that um, some think may should be in. You know. But that the 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 men of the Great Assembly were the ones that um, set the precedent that we observe today. Prayer. The second monumental accomplishment of the men of the Great Assembly was the formulation of a universal Jewish prayer service. Today, the centerpiece of every service is the prayer known as the Amidah, literally the standing prayer. It and its attendant prayers were apparently absent from the first temple era. The need for such a formalized prayer only first arose when the Jews went into exile in Babylon. The missing experience of community that, that went part and parcel with the three times of three times a year pilgrimage to the temple left a vacuum. Without the temple, essential nutrients of people's religious diet were lacking. Therefore, the leaders in Babylon codified a system of prayer that substituted the temple service. They based this on the prophetic vision, our lips will substitute for the sacrifices. In other words, their prayers would substitute for the sacrifices. When the Jews returned from Babylon to the land of Israel and rebuilt the temple, they brought along with them the prayers they had learned in Babylon. The men of the great assembly ordered, edited, and formulated the words of the Amidah, as well as its surrounding prayers. This arrangement continued through the entire second temple era and remains today. Although the individual synagogue system was inferior, inferior to the temple, it successfully compensated for the shift in Jewish life away from the centralized temple system. Now, with the stamp of approval of the men of the Great Assembly, Jewish prayer became possible in each community, in each individual, no matter how far he or she was away, instituting prayer this way not only substituted for the temple service, but compensated for the loss of the center of Jewish life, which was the temple in Jerusalem. The calendar was the third major accomplishment of the men of the Great Assembly. When the communists came to power in Russia in 1917, they banned the Jewish calendar even before they banned the prayer book. They realized that without knowing the precise dates of the Jewish holy days, no Jew could possibly maintain his religion. If one Jew thought Yom Kippur was Wednesday and one thought it was Thursday and another thought Friday, the structure of Jewish life would collapse. Therefore, they banned the calendar first. The Jewish calendar is based on the cycle of the moon. However, if it were a strict lunar calendar, then every year would be 11 and a quarter days less than the solar year. 
The problem then would be that in three years, an entire month would be lost. In six years, two months would be lost and so forth. Eventually, a holiday like Passover would come out in the dead of winter and then the fall and then the summer and then the spring again. It just wouldn't work. In fact, this is precisely the situation in, with the Muslim calendar, which is entirely lunar. After a period of time, their holidays traverse the entire year. The Torah, however, expressly commands that Passover fall out in the springtime, which refers the vernal equinox. Therefore, the Jewish sages added a leap month to the Jewish year. The solar and lunar years line up exactly every 19 years. Therefore, seven times every 19 years an entire month is added. Not only were the Jewish leaders great Torah scholars, but they had great knowledge in astronomy, mathematics, as well as secular disciplines. Among the proofs of their intellectual skills or mathematical calculations they made back then for determining the exact moment of the lunar month. The Talmud in Rosh Hashanah 25a tells us that based on those calculations and a tradition going back to Sinai, Jewish months are calculated at 29.53059 days. Only first with the advent of modern technology Solar satellites, hairline telescopes, laser beams, and supercomputers were NASA science able to determine the length of a synodic month, i.e. the time between one new moon and the next. That figure was 29.5305. The basis for the permanent calendar was laid by the man of the great assembly. They perfected all the mathematical adjustments and intricacies that make a Jewish calendar laser beam accurate even by today's standards, which is a truly remarkable feat. The fourth accomplishment of the men of the Great Assembly was the establishment of an educational system in the land of Israel. From the time of immemorial, Jewish survival has always depended on knowledge, passing it down from generation to generation. As we mentioned previously, the settlers who originally, retur originally returned with Ezra and Nehemiah were not the elite Jewish people. Consequently, the educational system was at best mediocre. It was the task of the men of the Great Assembly to revamp and revitalize it. You know, as I was studying all this, it was really interesting to see the difference between the elite, what we term the rabbis, and the ones that were leading things, and the ones we read about, and the common people that were being taught by these folks, that were just getting it from... Um, going because you know we, we have this wonderful gift of having um, the internet and the, the age of information and books and all the things that we have they didn't have all that they had they had to go and get it from the uh, from the temple and then they, then they had they had to live it it was interesting to to learn how those that group would follow the Pharisees and how the Pharisees were able to win the the trust of that that group of people which was the masses. The problem that the men of the Great Assembly faced was not only building, but raising funds. They had to have schools and they had to attract students. Israel had lost credibility as a Torah center for the, center for the world while they were away. It had been destroyed, so they were, they were trying to reestablish it. It was surrounded by enemies and it was economically unstable. They therefore mounted a campaign to reestablish Israel and specifically Jerusalem, as the center for the Jewish people. One of the first things they did toward that end was to reestablish the Sanhedrin, the central body of, of Torah authority. Once operational again, they let it be known that all important questions of Jewish law should be, should be sent to Jerusalem. Ancient documents discovered about a century ago bear out how well this strategy worked. The documents referred to became known as the I don't really butcher this up. Elephatin Papari. I got it. They were written by members of a garrison of Jewish mercenaries stationed near what is today Osundam. The Greeks called it Elephantine because they transported elephants to and from there. The group consisted of about 150 soldiers, along with their families, who were on permanent station there. It was mind boggling. It was, it was the end of the world at the time. There were 150 Jews, 
hired to collect custom duties from the Persian Empire and prevented marauding African tribes from entering Egypt. Some job for a nice Jewish boy. These Jews knew they were Jews, but little else. They wrote a letter to the high priest in Jerusalem asking them, him basic questions such as what day was Rosh Hashanah? Where do they get matzah for Passover and how did they make them? How do they build a mikvah for a ritual immersion? And which way was the synagogue supposed to face? In essence, the letter said, make us Jews. We want to be Jews. Please help us. Since these letters were written in Aramaic, we can surmise that the people originated in Babylon. This is exactly what the men of the great assembly, the men of the great assembly began working about to reestablish the central address for all Jewry in Jerusalem. What happened out of all this was that now that they'd come back and Ezra and Nehemiah had set up this temple, the power now went from the kingship, there wasn't the kingship anymore, the power went into the priesthood. The priesthood became the power. So, when, so in, in the second temple era, when we read about the, the, um, the story of, of Yeshua and the things he was dealing with, the priesthood was the power. It was the Sanhedrin. That's what the Sadducees were, were, were head of, was the Sanhedrin. So the power had shifted from the royal, the monarchy, into the, uh, into the priesthood. So, that brings us to um, after the second temple was destroyed. So the men of the great assembly had set up the life in the second temple. It's important to understand that the destruction of the second temple in, in um, 70 AD caused a catastrophic upheaval of the Jewish people. How could the sages understand Judaism and practice their faith apart from the rituals and sacrifices asked offered by the priestly services. How could they do without their temple? With the temple gone, who would be the religious authority for the Jewish people? Rabbi Yonan ben Zaki, a formal, former pupil of Hillel, left Jerusalem after the temple was destroyed and found a new center of Jewish learning in Yavne. Um, will y'all change that slide? Thank you. The Council of Yavne was from 70 to 90 CE, and it subsequently reinvented Judaism by one decreeing that the animal sacrifices and temple rituals could be replaced by prayer and good deeds, subjecting the Septuagint's translation of the scriptures and establishing the canon of the Hebrew scriptures officially, adding the so-called Berkat Hamanim to the daily prayers at the synagogue which is basically what they did is they added to the Amidah a portion that was to um, reject, I guess, the heretics, which were the Messianic believers. They, they were so, uh, the, the, by this time, by 70 to 90 CE and the temple had been destroyed, this new faith of Messianic believers had taken on a tremendous um, uh, presence. They, they, they had a tremendous presence and they'd had a tremendous influence on so many people and so much on Jewry that, that they had at this point rejected them completely and had decided to, um, to add something into the Amidah, Amidah to reject them. Yonahan ben Zaki disciples included the famous Rabbi Akiva, a proponent of the false messiah, Shimeon Bar Kopka, I should know that, how to pronounce that, and y'all know who that's the one that failed when he tried to attack the, um, the Romans and caused the destruction of, of Jerusalem. Rabbi Judah Hanasi the Prince became the chief editor of the Mishnah, a collection of earlier interpretations of the sages and of the house of Halil and the house of Shammai of Pharisaic period. The Mishnah, the word Mishnah means repetition. It essentially records the debates of the post-temple sages from 70 to 200 AD. 
the Mishnah, even though the Council of Yevna kind of began the process of recording the Oral Torah, it actually wasn't put to writing until 200 A.D. A collection of earlier interpretations of the sages, including the accounts of the House of Hillel and Shemei. It was the first work, first major work, of what is, would be known as rabbinical Judaism, which is what we, Judaism is by far um, composed of today. Can y'all switch the, the slide? Keep going. Hard when you're not controlling these slides. One more. I don't know if you can read that or not. But there are six orders to the Mishnah, and it's topical more so than hist historical. There is Zerim, which is seeds, and it's dis discussions concerning prayer and dietary and agricultural laws. The Mishnah is a, a collection of volumes and volumes of books. I actually have a Mishnah. It takes up two bookshelves, okay? There's... there's, there's there, there are major, so th this one, this Zevarim, is probably about seven or eight books. And it discusses, discusses prayer and dietary and agricultural laws. The second um, track tape is um, Moed, which is festival. It discusses about appointed times and the holidays. There's Nashim, which is women. It discusses about women and family life. goes into things like marriage and the role of the woman the, and, and how you're supposed to treat women and their, their role in society. It's amazing. Nezikin, which is damages. It discusses about civil laws and damages and compensation. There's uh, Kodashim, which is the holy things. It discusses regarding sacrifices, offerings, dedications, and other temple matters. They didn't want to lose what they did in the temple. They wanted to have it in writing. They want, they want it there for when that third temple comes back. They want to know exactly what it is that they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to do it. Torot, which is purities. It discusses regarding the purities of vessels, foods, dwellings, and people. So the Mishnah was established, and after the Mishnah was published, it was studied exhaustively by generations of rabbis in both Babylon, Babylonia and Israel, Babylon and Israel. Over the next three centuries, additional commentaries on the Mishnah were compiled and put together as was known as the Gemara. Actually, there's two different versions of the Gemara. One is compiled by the scholars in Israel in around 400 AD, and the other was, was composed in Babylon in the year 500 AD. Together, the Mishnah and the Gemara form the Talmud. So there's actually two Talmuds. There's a Jerusalem Talmud and there's a Babylonian Talmud. With the rise of the rabbinical Judaism, Torah could mean something far more than the words of Moses. The oral Torah was considered a legally binding commentary on the written Torah, interpreting and explaining how its commandments are to be carried out. The quote from Perkei Avot, now Perkei Avot is actually part of the Mishnah, it's, 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 that's where it comes from, is a part of the reinvention of the post-Temple Ju Judaism, wherein the religious authority is said to have passed from Moses to Joshua by Simcha through various generations of elders and eventually the rabbis themselves. In its widest sense, then, Oral Torah includes all the interpretations and conclusions that the sages deduced from the written Torah, as well as the regulations instituted by them. Because rabbinical Judaism um, kind of gives this credit as a line of succession but from Moses to the post-Temple rabbis, some rabbis, such as Rabbi Joseph ben Levi, a contributor of the Gemara, has gone so far as to claim that the essence of all later rabbinical t teachings were given to Moses on the mountain. In other words, all the writings that all these people did from the second, temp second century on to lay all this out was all given to Moses on Sinai and they were just recreating it. Now I have a hard time with that. Definitely have a hard time with that. Um, let's do this. This is a, um, a book of Jewish concepts. Coolest thing. If you ever want to know anything about Judaism, get you a book of Jewish concepts. 
because within this book, and, and I, I'm going to give you three concepts, and these, these concepts are concepts of the, um, the Mishnah and the Talmud. Here, you've, we've heard the term Midrash before, right? You ever heard the term Midrash? Midrash can mean different things to different folks, but this is what Judaism defines the term Midrash. Midrash is investigation. It signifies study and interpretation. For the most part, the purpose of the Midrashic literature is to explain the biblical text from an ethical and devotional point of view. There's two different types of Midrash. There's a Midrash Haggadah. It's a form of teaching that seeks to admonish and edify. If you wish to know the creator of the world, learn Haggadah, for it will come for, from it, you will come to know God and cling to his ways. The Midrash has proved an unfailing spring with power to sustain and strengthen the Jewish thirst for the word of the living God. Ever since the third century, the most flourishing period of Haggadic activity in the Holy Land, the Midrash has represented an important medium for the expression of Jewish thought. When you read these commentaries, be it the Mishnah, the Talmud, combination of both, that's what you're getting is a lot of Midrash. So what is this Haggadah? And why is that important? Haggadah or Haggadah means narration. It includes everything in Talmudic literature that is not of legal nature, such as descriptions of historical events and legends, proverbs, that illustrate moral duties, scientific data concerning medicine, mathematics, astrology, astronomy, physiology, botany, and other branches of knowledge. About 30% of the Talmud and Mishnah is Agadah. The aim and the purpose of the Agadahic literature is to inspire and edify, and to move people to the kind of righteous behavior which Haggadah requires. The Agadah penetrates deeply into the spirit of the Bible by means of its broad interpretations of the text. From the wealth of Agadic material, the Jewish people continue to receive comfort and strength as they have for many generations. Here's some examples. Love your wife as much as yourself. Honor her more than yourself. The noblest charity of all is that which enables the poor to earn their living. A liar finds his punishment in being disbelieved even when he tells the truth. When good people die, they are not truly dead, for their example lives. Hence we are told that Jacob never died. Though the Agadah contains parables and infinite beauty and enshrines sayings of everlasting worth and consists of individual utterances that possess no binding authority. They're like, um, they're like wise sayings, wise things that touch your heart and touch your soul and make, make, make sense. The, the, the third thing that I wanted to cover was, um, and this is, was uh, halakha. You've heard the term halakha before, right? The term halakha is used in the sense of Talmudic law, guidance, and traditional practice. The final decision of the rabbinic sages on disputed rules of contact, conduct. Halakha frequently, frequently denotes those sections of rabbinic literature which deal with Jewish legal tradition, tradition which is counter to Agadah. It includes ethical, which you know, we, we, we just went over Agadah. Halakha is the laws. It's basically taking the laws that are in the Torah and then expounding on those laws and putting fences around those laws to keep you from breaking those laws. That's what halakha is. So when you, when you hear the word halakha, it's actually what the rabbis have done to, um, to protect the Torah. They've, 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 they've identified those laws, described those laws in detail, explained those laws in detail, and then they have um, put fences around them to keep them, the laws from being broken. So that's kind of what halakha is, or halakha. I 
I know I'm going to run out of time. We got started a little late. Um, I can turn this in. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be here next week, so we. I don't know that I'll be able to finish this today. Actually, let's see here. Well, maybe. Let's do. Let's do. Let's do what we can here. So, I'll, as Dan used to say, get this in Yankee gear a little bit. The case of the Oral Torah. Is there a case to be made for the existence of the Oral, oral Torah? Yes, there is. First, it should be noted that the Oral Torah is sometimes considered to be more basic than the written Torah of Moses. It's argued that since God first spoke the Ten Commandments to the Jews, before Moses ascended to Sinai to get the details, oral Torah actually preceded the giving of the Torah at Sinai. The same point can be made, incidentally, regarding the patriarchs, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. None of them had the Torah. When Moses descended from Sinai the second time, he verbally explained the specific mitzvot, mishpatim, to the 70 elders of Israel, thereby passing on an oral Torah to the leadership of Israel. When Moses' father-in-law Jethro saw how the people came to Moses to help them, help them interpret the meaning of the Torah, he advised Moses to appoint various judges to interpret the written Torah to, in specific cases. Later, Moses anticipated the need for these joy, judges to be appointed in every city of the Promised Land, and this is the origin of the Bet Din, which is the Jewish law court system. The written Torah, like all other writing, is subject to interpretation. And that's what the oral Torah is doing. It's giving us interpretation. Whereas the Bible tells you to wear tzitzit, it doesn't tell you how to wear tzitzit. It doesn't tell you how to, conf how to make tzitzit. Whereas the Bible tells you um, all these different things that are given to you in generalities, what the oral Torah is doing is it's, 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 um, it's, it's giving you the details of that. So there is, there is definitely um, value in the Oral Torah. What about Yeshua in the Oral Torah? On the one hand, Yeshua agreed with much of the prevailing thinking of the Pharisees. When asked what was the greatest commandment of the Lord, Yeshua would quote the portion of the Shema that says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Then he added this commandment, the Via Hafta, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeshua willingly subjected himself to the religious authorities of the day, the Sanhedrin, when he was commanded by the high priest to confess, confess his identity during his trial, Yeshua apparently complied. Yeshua did this in order to fulfill the requirement of the Torah and to become the sacrificial victim that he was. The last Passover Yeshua also indicates that he observed the elements of oral traditions when he blessed the bread and the cups he was following the general pattern of the Seder meal, which was endorsed by the sages of his day. There is this thought that when he would rebuke the Pharisees, that he was um, against the Pharisees. The Pharisees were considered the most faithful to the Torah, which is precisely why Yeshua criticized them when they did evil in the name of the religious piety. In order to understand the things that Yeshua said to the Pharisees, you must first properly understand their place within the wide variety of sects and peoples of Judaism in the Second Temple era. At that time, the Jews lived under Roman occupation and client kingship of the family of Herod. And Herod was an Edomene, which was, a, which, was a, um, which was considered one of the sects of Judaism. There were many different sectarian groups of Jews in those days, some of which we know more about than others. The Sadducees were one group of which we knew about primarily from Josephus and a few rabbinic sources. Many of them belonged to the ruling aristocracy, aristocracy, arist you know, the, and they were descendants of the Hasmonean family, which had ruled Judea in the Maccabean period. Although revolting against Hellenism, the Hasmonean kings eventually became Hellenized in their culture and though they tried to remain relatively strict in religious matters, especially those that related to the temple, they were not a large group, but they had tremendous influence over the wealth and political power that they controlled, and they controlled the Jerusalem temple. The Sadducees disappeared once the temple was destroyed. 
the Pharisees were the ones that 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 um, that actually um, that actually survived. There was also the the Essenes and the Zealots that were around at that period of time. But the Pharisees, about whom we read in Josephus in the New Testament, were a group of Jer- of Jewish religious leaders who tried to apply the Torah to every matter of daily life and therefore spent much of their time developing halakha, which consisted of oral traditions on how to put the written Torah into practical usage. The question of their relationship to the rabbis or sages of the later rabbinic literature is a complex one, especially since the only ancient Jews who were willing to write about themselves publicly were the Pharisees that were Paul and Josephus. Both Paul and Josephus were Pharisees and they wrote about themselves publicly. We have their writings. It's used to be commonly thought that the Pharisees just changed their name to the rabbis after the destruction of the second temple. They trace rabbinical Judaism back to the Pharisees and and their their, their, um, their, um, beliefs. So, Yeshua and his disciples and Paul had a completely Pharisaic worldview, as one sees from Paul's behavior before the Sanhedrin. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Yeshua routinely associated with Pharisees and trusted their standards of purity, food, kosher laws, dishes. This concept's important to remember when examining the story of when he criticizes the Pharisees. True worship of God doesn't consist of ceremonies or praise and music, but it's rather in keeping the commandments. That is the example that Yeshua gave us. Correcting the mistakes of our neighbors in love is a commandment from both the the Torah and the New Testament. As Leviticus 19.17 says, you should not hate your brother in your heart, but you should surely reason with him so that you will not bear sin on his account. Is that not what Yeshua was doing with his Pharisees? Was he not rebuking his brothers? You know, he had the authority to do that. He definitely had the authority to do that. People who convert to an, a, any religion can, be so, can, can become so fanatical about their religion that they begin to hate and despise everyone who does not have their same zeal and level of this term religiosity to the point that their company becomes unbearable. I can relate to that. Zeal for God is a wonderful thing. But that zeal has to be seasoned. And that's a very, very uh, important word, seasoned with grace, love, and humility if we expect our passion for God to be attractive to anyone else. So, as a conclusion, practically speaking, the oral Torah essentially invites us to relegate the study of written Torah to a glorious footnote in Jewish history. True, the written Torah is considered foundational, but is merely the historical starting point for the greater discussion about what Torah means to us today. Hence, we see some forms of Jewish observance at a minimal interest in the actual words of Torah. They they worship the Talmud. It's all about the Talmud and at the expense of, of, of the written Torah. The oral Torah is applicable to us today. It's an invaluable resource that will help us better understand Hashem's scriptures, Hashem's word, okay? But the oral Torah should always always be used as a filter, and it should always be compared to the written Torah. Because the written Torah is the word of God. The oral Torah is the interpretation of man. So always go with the word of God. If you're confused, if you're in doubt, with use the written word and use your heart for if your heart's with the Lord if your heart is truly with the Lord you will not be led astray so let's close with a prayer Alvinu Shabbat Shemayim our Father in Heaven Father thank you so much for this glorious Shabbat day once again and for bringing us here safe 
and for all the blessings that you bestowed upon us this week. Father, I pray that we'll have a great service today honoring you, drawing near to you, and doing everything in your honor, Father. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. All right.